when you get to this stage, when yes. are you going down the road with only one? Or are you going down the road with several? You might be going down the road with two or three. I've been in, in transactions in, in my career where I've had as many as three negotiations going on. And the, the, the buyers, because of, if it's done through an auction process, they understand that they need to beat out everybody else. Now, what you have to be careful of is if you've got non-disclosure agreements with them, they are not supposed to disclose anything to anybody else, but you're not supposed to disclose what you've learned about them to the other buyer, prospective buyers. And I've seen uh, aggressive sellers sort of take it in their own hands without involving the lawyers and say, well, so-and-so offered me this. And you're gonna get sued in that type of environment if the documents were drafted originally, the non-disclosure agreements were drafted properly. So you wanna be really careful about that. But the idea is that it's, it's an ongoing negotiation until the best letter of intent comes in, in my view. Now, we've also done it where the indications of interest come in. So we had, in one deal uh, last year, we had three IOIs, indication of interest, and they, have, they were different price points, and they also said some other things in the indication of interest that gave us a clue that one of them was really the best. So we went with one of them, we got down the road of negotiating, and then they did I'm jumping ahead, but they did a quality of earnings analysis, and they didn't think that the seller's representations regarding their business were accurate, so they wanted to lower the price down to what one of the other indications of interest were. So we cut off negotiations. We said, nope, we're not interested. Um, we, we think our earnings are good. We don't think you really understand our business or how it works, and that was, in fact, the case. We went with a, a third one of the other indications of interest. We renewed negotiations. We closed the transaction for a higher purchase price than what was offered by the original, and we closed it in March, and the seller was ecstatic. I mean, they, were, they were very, very happy about that. And that was with the help of a very good investment banker. I think they did an excellent job on that. So non-binding. There are some provisions that you want to have binding, but in the letter of intent, you're gonna to wanna to see what the purchase price is, you're gonna to wanna to see what the structure of the deal is. Now, oftentimes they'll leave that. They'll say, well, tax considerations will be taken into, you know, uh, you know at a later date. But that leaves open, you know, the, the elephants in the room. If the tax liability is gonna be 20% higher, if, the, if you're gonna do it differently, we really would like to know how we're gonna deal with that now. So that, that's my view of the world. Um, if we're going to exclude certain assets, or more importantly, liabilities, do they have to be paid down in closing? We want to know what your thoughts are on how this deal is going to be structured. And, and I've gone two different ways on this issue, employment agreements and non-competes. If the employment agreement and the non-compete is a huge issue for the sellers, the key employees, we want to get a clear indication of what they're going to be paying our key people and what they're going to be requiring them to do and not to do after the acquisition. So we'd like to get a better idea of that up front instead of waiting until the end, which is what the investment bankers like to do and what the buyer likes to do. Until like the last week, they'll drop an employment agreement on the lap of the key employees and they'll say, well, you've got 24 hours to review it and sign it. And that's not necessarily, it doesn't generate the most positive response from employees, okay, in my experience. And then you could close the transaction, They may have been sort of forced into signing these employment agreements or non-competes, and they really didn't have a chance to understand what they've just signed. And I've seen that happen many times. Um, and you can negotiate out from under it, but we're involved right now in litigation on behalf of one individual. We didn't represent them in the acquisition, but he came to us after the acquisition, and he wanted to start up the same business that he was involved in selling. He wasn't the primary guy. He got some money out of the deal, but uh, he violated a specific term in the non-compete, and he was sued. And he's gonna have to give back, not only the legal fees he's paying us in this case, but he's gonna have to give back some of the consideration in a settlement. Hopefully we won't go to trial on this. Hopefully we're gonna have a settlement. And he just did, he didn't really realize what this language was saying, and he, he was kind of a, a cowboy, like a lot of our entrepreneurs are, they go out and they just say, ah, never happened to me, ah, this doesn't apply to me, ah, that's just legal mumbo jumbo, and the legal mumbo jumbo comes back and bites you in the ass. So getting that stuff in the letter of intent 
may be a good idea, or at least getting a form of employment agreement may be a good idea. The binding provisions that we typically put into a letter of intent are confidentiality provisions, non-disclosure. We, we want e either you've, you're incorporating the prior NDA that you signed into the letter of intent, and that will continue to be a binding provision on all parties. And a word on NDAs, by the way, an M&A transaction. If I'm representing the seller, I want to make sure that the buyers who are, I'm negotiating with don't take the information that I give them and use it against me, including going after my customers or going after my employees, particularly in the government contract services area. I don't want them going after one of my key employees who's working on a, prime, a major contract or a prime contract that they can then go in and solicit. So I don't want them soliciting my employees, even if we don't do a deal. Um, so binding provisions. Another binding provision is exclusivity. When you sign the letter of intent, you've gotten past this range of negotiation. <clears throat> there hasn't been a lot of due diligence conducted at this stage. The buyer hasn't gone and peeked under the tent to see what's really there. And so what they want to have the opportunity to do for some period of time is to do that without interference from other buyers coming in. So Miriam, to your point, when the letter of intent is signed, if it's got an exclusivity provision in it, or a no-shop provision in it, the seller is going to agree for some period of time, and that's usually negotiated, not to be negotiating the sale of the business with anybody else. And if they get approached by anybody else, they'll notify the buyer. So it's a provision that ends up winding it, its way into the letter of intent. If I'm the seller and I propose the letter of intent, it's certainly not going to be in there, but it usually comes back with sophisticated counsel on the other side. Any other binding provisions you typically see, Ted, in the letter of intent? Those would be the main ones, but going back to your, your employment agreement, yep. we may hit this a little later, um, but where there's a retention package that's gonna be necessary for the team, where do you, where do you put that if you're the seller? knowing that it's gonna be a deduction from your proceeds. So, in this deal that's been taking a year, I don't know if you were in here when I was talking about the, the year-long deal that's hopefully gonna close before the end of October. We started negotiating it actually in August of last year. It's a small deal, but the buyer, you know, the seller had one thing that he wanted. He wanted an integration plan, and he wanted to know what his guys were gonna be paid, and, and bonuses and compensation upfront before we, we go to closing. Reasonable? Retention package it was a huge piece of this. Um, it's, it's really what we call an earnout, but recharacterized as a retention package because we were going to take some of these proceeds that he was going to get and reallocate them among the key employees to make sure that they stayed and they produce on the contracts that they're supposed to produce. I personally, again, would prefer to have it up front in the letter of intent so that everybody knows, again, what we're going to get in the end. What is the seller, what are the owners going to get in the end? What are the option holders going to get? Phantom stockholders, what are the key employees going to get in the end, at the end of the, uh, at the closing, or after the closing? So I like that. M&A process. In a nutshell, this is what I view as the M&A process. You can lay it out horizontally in a timeline, which is what we usually see from investment bankers when they're making proposals to represent our clients uh, as the investment banking team. So I've just pulled bits and pieces of that. And from my own memory, just off the top of my head, but the first thing you want to do in the, in the M&A process is, if you're really planning on selling the company, get ready to sell it. Uh, lawyers are extremely important in that process. Accountants are extremely important in that process. And there are companies out there that uh, we work with that are experts in due diligence, getting you essentially building your data room so that every new contract is added to your data room, every new employment agreement is added, and you have your regular files and you have your deal files. And you're building it in anticipation of the sale. Because if you do it at the last minute, it's gonna get screwed up and there's gonna be a mess. So this one deal that we, we, had, we sold at a premium, um, they were really good at bringing in business, servicing the customers, and doing everything they had to do to generate the revenue and the profit. They were really bad at internal infrastructure. They had 300 employees, 150 had invalid I-9s. 
I think I mentioned this in an earlier, a couple of earlier segments, but if you have an invalid I-9 for the immigration authorities, the penalties can be as high as $2,100 per I-9. So we, we ended up sending labor and employment lawyers in-house to basically clean up that mess, and it was a huge mess. So doing the legal housekeeping and the <coughs> diligence ahead of time is absolutely critical. Financial housekeeping, making sure you know your books and records are in tip-top shape, that your allocations, if you're a government contractor, are in tip-top shape, making sure that you've got your waterfall of your contracts laid out, so that when the investment bankers come in, and the buyer's diligence team comes in to do quality of earnings analysis and all the other stuff that they've got to do, it's clean. 